Good morning, good day, and good evening to all our attendees joining us for today's latest Data Science Central webinar. I'd like to start our event off today by thanking Trace3 for sponsoring today's event. This is Trace3's second time sponsoring one of the DSC educational webinars in support of the DSC community, and we are honored to have them sponsoring today's webinar. I'd also like to take this opportunity to mention and show our appreciation for some of our other recent sponsors, including Hortonworks, Cisco, Splunk, Tableau, Teradata, and Pivotal, to name just a few. These past webinars and many others are available at datasciencecentral.com on demand, and I'd encourage you to take a look as they do provide some very useful information. Today's webinar is entitled De Hadoop Deployment Best Practices, Scalability, Robustness, and Flexibility. And before we begin, I'd like to briefly review the format of today's webinar. Hold on a moment. Are you guys, um, I'm not progressing my slide. Let's see if I can push this. Sorry for that, folks. Having a little bit of trouble here. Again, the webinar is entitled Hadoop Deployment Best Practices, Scalability and Robustness. My apologies for that brief uh, issue there. Today's webinar will be approximately one hour long. We have two panelists that I'll, pre I'll present to you all in just a few moments. We should have about 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A following the presentation, and this webinar is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon. I would also like to encourage all attendees to provide questions throughout the presentation. We will be reviewing them and presenting them on your behalf during the Q&A portion of today's event. My name is Tim Madison. I'm one of the co-founders of Data Science Central, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. I'm very pleased to introduce today's panelists, Judd Pickett of Trace3 and Chris Harold of EMC. Judd is currently working at Trace3 as a big data practice architect in Denver, Colorado. Previously, he worked as a field SE at EMC and at a startup in Boulder where he built out a high-performance computing environment for analyzing the world's largest collection of recorded child speech for kids age, ages 0 to 5. Judd has an MBA from Regis University and a Bachelor's of Science in Computer Science. Chris is the Divisional Analytics Specialist for EMC and has a 20-plus year career in information technology with companies such as Microsoft, TW Telecom, and CenturyLink. His expertise is currently applied to the development of large-scale analytics solutions for EMC customers around Hadoop and emerging analytics platform technologies. Chris attended Syracuse University in Syracuse. Welcome to you both, and we're looking forward to your presentations. In today's webinar, we will be discussing how Trace3 and EMC provide a multi-purpose infrastructure for Hadoop environments. Our panel will also explain in detail the pros and cons of various design choices and walk you through real-world cases with associated performance improvements. You will learn how to effectively solve various problems with scaling Hadoop, a better model for lower-cost data lake, which model supports the needs of enterprise customers with the greatest interoperability for your business applications, as well as your data analytics activities, how customers are leveraging alternative design choices, and finally, details of tangible productivity and cost benefits associated to these design choices. So Judd, when you're ready to go, uh, you can proceed. Thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. It's great to be here at DSC, and thanks everybody for attending. I'm going to start off really quickly by telling you a little bit about Trace3 before we jump right into the material. Trace3 is a pioneer in business transformation solutions and empowers companies to lead in their respective market space by keeping pace with the rapid changes in IT innovations, ensuring relevance to specific business initiatives. We do this by leveraging the latest Silicon Valley cloud, big data, and data center technologies, and by maximizing organizational health, the people in people process and technology. From a big data perspective, Trace3 has a well-established big data intelligence practice, or BDI practice. Our BDI practice provides education, a strategic data intelligence roadmap, and it can assist in guiding you as you deploy big data technologies and optimize processes in your organization. All right, jumping right into the material. This should look pretty familiar for anyone who has uh, used or investigated a Hadoop environment in the past. 
This is a pretty standard Hadoop infrastructure where you have various data feeds uh, feeding into your data lake or your HDFS storage environment. Sometimes uh, there's a landing zone in the mix there. But this is pretty typical uh, of what you would see as you build out a Hadoop environment today. Now, no big data presentation would be complete with at least one elephant, so I thought we would get that elephant out of the way as early as possible. From the previous slide, we know that storage and compute typically grow in lockstep from an architectural perspective. As you add server nodes to your cluster, you also add CPU cores and storage capacity. Unfortunately, uh, changing economics and business requirements in the ever-growing lake of data can make your Hadoop environment more fragile. In other words, your consumption needs may not map cleanly and linearly with your architecture and design choices. And design decisions made with balance in mind can change over time. Trying to keep everything in balance and running smoothly can be a challenge. Let's talk about some of the ways that this can present itself in uh, typical bare metal to dupe environments. So I think that if you look at your typical Hadoop infrastructure like we saw earlier, they can often have one of two problems. It can either be pretty storage heavy with not enough compute resources represented by the brain here, or they can be storage limited, plenty of brains, not enough storage. Um, you know, you have CPUs doubling every 18 months, and design decisions impact flexibility now, but um, customers are looking for not only enterprise features, flexibility, but they also don't want to be uh, put in a situation where they're not going to have flexibility going forward. And if we think about these design decisions and how they impact us today and how we can have this imbalance, let's actually take a look at how that could even be worse uh, in the future as we see CPU uh, performance increasing over time. So if you look at what, what's going on right now in the silicon space, the race for smaller, faster, cheaper, um, we can think about the compute and the storage imbalance and consider how these different components changing over time can impact that. We look at the roadmaps of where big chip giants are heading, uh, trying to keep pace with Moore's law, and we can see new uh, transport technologies using light to remove heat and resistance. Core density continues to increase, and the next generation of chip architectures continue to shrink as they move down from 22 nanometer to 14 to 10 to 7. And it's 7 nanometer the distance between components is equivalent to 16 potassium atoms side by side. It's pretty crazy. At this point, new technology needs to take over. So parallel R&D efforts around these more interesting chip design architectures will probably bear fruit sooner than we think. Needless to say, CPU horsepower is not accelerating at the same pace as storage technology. And now that we've seen where compute is going, let's take a look at the other side of the coin. Let's look at the other major component of Hadoop, and that's the future of storage. The future is kind of hazy when it comes to where disk will be as it compares to CPU, and CPUs continue to accelerate. There's different varying and competing camps out there that believe flash will present itself uh, and represent a big portion of high performance workload. Um, but a massive data lake may have a substantial portion of rarely accessed data. Uh, and others argue that densities and economics of flash will change the game for disk and we may need to be able to pivot so we can take advantage of Flash's potential lower than disk costs as technology progresses on the low end. So we think about this from a Hadoop perspective, how do we retrofit an existing environment? If we go ahead and build out our, our Hadoop environment using traditional design paradigms, and then we later have to change and adopt these new technologies, um, storage specifically, how do we do that? Do we strip hard, hard drives out of our nodes and replace those with SSDs? Or do we run Hadoop bits on Flash living on a RAID controller so that we can free up slots to give us more scale? Um, there's, there's, there's complexity with either of these different approaches, and it's difficult to make changes over time. Once you've kind of made your design decisions in a traditional Hadoop environment, you're kind of going to end up moving in lockstep that way as you grow the cluster out, unless you start scaling out and building separate and distinct clusters, which presents yet additional challenges. When you break apart storage from compute sizing, though, it can give you flexibility in design and adaptability. And with the flash revolution still in its early stages, the economics may not fit the bulky storage use case yet, and, and it's hard to know what the best way to build that out is today using traditional paradigms. 
if we if we think about this in in, a, in the perspective of decoupling compute and storage, there may be other factors outside the specific use case that we're, that we're designing for today that could also leverage the same infrastructure. So instead of building a point product focused solution just for one Hadoop workload, we may see some tangible cost avoidance benefits from being able to collapse other other applications and use cases onto the same infrastructure as we build it out. But to do that, we would definitely need something that's scalable, high performance, and offers uh, um, the kind of storage that we need to support Hadoop, as well as those traditional use cases, to be able to, to take advantage of those cost savings. Beat EMC Isilon, this is a great fit for this type of solution. So Isilon does just that by providing multi-protocol access and scale-out capabilities. Isilon provides flexibility to support various workloads and can be a great foundation for a deep data lake architecture. Isilon was built for big NAS workloads and has been adapted to include HDFS functionality. So now you get your multi-protocol with a Duke file system support as well. Let's look and see how this compares to traditional architecture. So here's another view of how compute and storage are coupled in a traditional stack. Each node has compute and captive storage. Also note that we have some Hadoop roles up top in, uh, in the form of name nodes, high availability name nodes, and those different roles are running on different servers within our Hadoop environment. Pretty typical for Hadoop. So we saw the disks and the compute all together within the nodes. Now if we look at this from an alternative perspective, we bring Isilon into the architecture, you can see how this can change. Isilon actually assumes the name node and data node role internally. So they are no longer running on servers in the, in the Hadoop environment, and it provides built-in high availability for those roles. So data moves off of the nodes, off of the compute nodes, off of the physical Hadoop storage servers, and moves into the Isilon storage system. This allows you to now independently scale the compute and the storage. So let's take a look at how Isilon can act as the storage target for a Hadoop cluster. Other than actually running HDFS internally on the array, Isilon actually uses one of the file system that's built into the Isilon architecture. And it doesn't follow the traditional HDFS scheme. It emulates HDFS to the Hadoop cluster nodes and uses one FS's file system internally. So you gain all the benefits of storage efficiency an enterprise feature set, but without the overhead of 3x mirroring typical with HDFS. To implement HDFS on Isilon, you can simply point your HDFS clients to the DNS name of the Isilon cluster. And you can also move your shuffle space to Isilon as well if you want to offload that performance and capacity from the server storage. Then you configure user and group access so you can get access to the data and you're up and running. And we give some examples here of what settings you modify and which files, and the commands you can run from the Isilon command line to modify the path where the Hadoop clients are actually going to access the file system. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to get up and running in an uh, Isilon environment with HDFS and Hadoop. So if we look at how this plays out over time as we begin to scale the system, we start to think about seeing compute and storage as different axes in our Hadoop environment. And in a traditional environment, obviously, those grow in lockstep, as we've, as we've said. And as our needs change, we have to grow those environments in lockstep as well, even if those needs don't map uh, in direct ratios between the storage and the compute axes, which can sometimes cause us to scale uh, improperly in an imbalanced fashion to the point where the words go off the slide, as you can see here. But if we think about this as uh, storage as its own resource and compute as a pool of resources, now we can kind of see where Isilon fits into the picture. We take all the storage out of the servers, we place those into the Isilon infrastructure, and now we can move away from dependent scaling and move toward independent scaling. So with independent scaling, we go through that same process where we, we take our workloads and they change over time, either becoming more compute heavy or more storage heavy. And we can watch those workloads and how that impacts our architecture as it grows. So as we grow in storage only, we don't necessarily need any more compute. We can simply scale out the Isilon architecture to support that additional storage capacity. 
but we don't have to continue to add servers or internal storage to those servers to do that. We have plenty of compute capacity here um, without the need to add additional servers just to give us more storage space. And if you look at it from the other perspective of, well, maybe I've got a more compute intensive environment that's less storage intensive, the same applies. We can spend our money where we need to, which is on the compute and the memory, and not spend additional money on the storage because the storage has already been satisfied by the original design. So here's a nice table to summarize some of the benefits. Um, the storage efficiency savings can be pretty substantial. Uh, there are design and cost avoidance components, utilization benefits, overhead reduction capabilities that can all lead to big environmental savings in addition to the lower investment in gear up front. So you get the high availability that we talked about. You get a lot of enterprise class features that we'll talk more about in a minute. And then Isilon inherently has a very efficient storage architecture internally where you can get up to 80% usable out of the storage. So a very high efficiency rating um, without all the overhead of mirroring that you would have. Plus you get the multi-protocol so you can throw uh, other workloads at it as well. Great benefits that we'll talk more about as we continue. So if you look at that from an environmental savings, uh, CapEx, OpEx savings, we, do this, we can do a, a TCO. And this is a real world customer TCO where a customer had a need for about 400 terabytes of raw capacity. And you can see a pretty substantial delta. Um, a lot of it comes down to the number of racks required, the density that you gain from Isilon, and the ability to independently scale those components so you can spend your money uh, more appropriately. You can really reduce your environmental spend, uh, especially in uh, your data center where power and cooling are at a premium. So why Isilon for Hadoop? Isilon fills a lot of the gaps that are not covered by the capabilities in the native Hadoop environment today. Isilon was built with simplicity in mind, even at scale. And the scalability to 20 petabytes in a single cluster, plus the ability to modify the performance and density capabilities with tiering, you get powerful features along with the core tenet of simple management. Customers are looking for enterprise class features as they move away from legacy architecture and toward next generation analytics and storage platforms. And Isilon provides robust WAN replication built for large data sets as one example. Replication in native Hadoop today is pretty immature and doesn't contain all of the hardened features that prevent massive resync or rescan over small WAN types. Um, checkpoint integration, and other key capabilities that enterprise customers have become accustomed to, quite honestly. So as you build out your data lake and you retain data for longer, being able to provide immutability and prevent accidental deletes can also be pretty important. And this is where SEC compliant WORM and Isilon smart lock, smart lock capabilities come into play. So making sure your data is safe, your data is off-site, um, and you're able to do that efficiently without having to uh, spend a ton of money on multiple copies of that data both on and off site to protect it all come into play. From a very specific enterprise feature set standpoint, Isilon comes with a whole slew of additional features that really set it apart from a traditional environment. So as Hadoop is just recently starting to add snapshot capabilities, they still have a long way to go. Isilon offers consistent snaps that can protect open files and, and files that are also being written to. That way you, know, you have a known good recovery point to recover to. A little different than the capabilities available in snapshots with native Hadoop today. And you can use any protocol to dump data into your shared data lake, which makes it a lot easier for legacy applications to feed data into HDFS without, taking the H, without talking directly and natively to the HDFS protocol. Plus, customers really want to protect that data no matter what, and that's where data at rest encryption comes into play. So, uh, robust data at rest encryption is available to guarantee those files are protected. And on top of the 80% efficiency benefits that we talked about, you can also do data deduplication with smart dedupe within Isilon. And, that, and smart dedupe can actually reduce your storage needs by up to 30% on top of that efficiency, depending on the data set. Now finally, we'll talk more about this in our use cases, but you can use Isilon to build out a Hadoop as a service to your internal users. So you can reduce management overhead and ease adoption as more and more of your internal users are starting to leverage a dupe in your environment. So 
one of the things that a lot of people don't think about is when I start to get to my Hadoop environment to scale and I really start to put uh, a lot of useful information in there and start storing data for longer periods of time so I can do more exhaustive analysis is just how big that data gets and how much data viscosity there is. It becomes very difficult to move that data around. We start thinking about how long it takes to move 100 terabytes from point A to point B, and it can, the time can be fairly substantial. Then you start talking about petabytes or exabytes, and, it, and it's even more so exacerbated. With iPhone, you store a single copy of your data, and you can reduce the transfer and load times by keeping everything in the single data lake. Huge benefits from a workflow perspective and reducing time to results. Now at this point, I want to take, take a step back, turn the, turn the time over to Chris Harold with EMC to walk you through a couple of real world use cases where customers have actually applied this type of architecture in their environment and seen the benefits that we've talked about. Chris? Thanks, Judd. So uh, good day and evening and night to uh, all of our attendees. Thank you guys for making time to uh, join this. Um, as Judd said, I wanted to take couple of, of slides here to show you some customers who have actually employed this uh, approach to scaling out their Hadoop deployments. Um, the first one is a, an email marketing company that uh, is here local to us in Colorado. Uh, at the time that they were working on this project a couple of years ago, Hadoop was still even uh, more uh, of a uh, ongoing project than it is today, uh, less adoption, less exposure. Uh, it was very new to us at Isilon as well. We've only recently started supporting it. And when they came to us and said, you know, we're, we're doing Hadoop, we ingest all these email logs, we have a real hard time doing both of those things at the same time. They would try and run their Hadoop jobs against their ingested data and it would bring their storage to a, to a halt. They were running on some, some older Sun uh, gear and they found that they just could not run the load that they needed to run on that. So we put in the Isilon backed uh, cluster solution. We had it up and running in less than a day. They were able to integrate their existing Hadoop nodes with the Isilon and point at the ingest data, run their jobs in place. A couple of things that it did for them, obviously, was the ability to not have to suspend or pause uh, login just from their customers while they were running their analytics jobs, which was uh, a huge benefit for them. But also, it actually cut down the overall time to results for them because they were able to run their analytics in place, no data movement, no bulk loading into HDFS, they were actually storing many, many copies of the data as we found out going through the, the process with them. So they were ingesting it onto the sun and then they were using a, an application to load into the HDFS file system which was making three additional copies back on the same array. So they were actually storing four copies of all of that data. Uh, we were able to get that down to one. So that cut down their storage requirements quite a bit as well which was a, a hidden benefit for them. What else it enabled them to do was to expand their cluster more rapidly than they had been able to previously because they didn't have to buy that storage and compute space in lockstep. The, the huge benefit that they were able to realize immediately, and this was a couple of years ago before people were really talking about it, was they were able to deploy some virtual uh, Hadoop nodes immediately to do some sandbox analysis projects. So try out some new analytics, try out the upgrade paths on their Hadoop distribution, and really kind of play around with the environment without disrupting their production operations. So they just found a, a, a lot of flexibility and a lot of hidden value that in the initial sort of blush we never even really came to grips with. So this, this was really a, a prime example of building out the value as we went along and finding all of these use cases that, that this impacted. And then a couple of years later, we worked with a large web analytics company that really took that to the next level. Their goal was providing Hadoop as a service. So they were running Hadoop. They were doing a number of things actively with it. Their, their challenge aside from just the, the sheer volume of data was that they were doing a number of things in the cloud. And their 
monthly spend in the cloud was in excess of a million dollars a month. And they realized right away that that was unsupportable going forward, and they needed to do something to bring that functionality and that level of flexibility in-house. So their, their goal was to deliver Hadoop as a service to their own internal organization. They used a, a, not just the Isilon solution from the EMC side, but, but Pivotal HD and uh, the Hawk capability as well as uh, vBlock VCE capability through VMware and Cisco, and then Isilon and VNX storage from, from EMC to build this entire platform for delivery and Hadoop as a service. What they found with that was not only were they able to do the Hadoop as a service component, which, which they were primarily interested in, but this overall infrastructure unlocked for them a number of additional use cases that they hadn't even really considered when we, when we began the project, as well as then all of the same things that, that the marketing company had seen before, which was now that we have this separation of storage and we can do things more rapidly, more flexibly than we could when we were trying to either provision into the cloud and then having to wait to move many hundreds of terabytes of data out to the cloud for analysis or trying to stand up physical, you know, commodity type servers in house where that takes a lot of time, it's very labor intensive, it takes up a lot of floor space. They're actually able to use a lot of existing infrastructure to support this. They were already a very large Isilon customer with about 14 petabytes of data on Isilon. Also, that 14 petabytes represents the vast majority of the data they wanted to analyze in the first place. And now they don't have to move it. They don't have to copy it into a, a Hadoop cluster. They don't have to copy it out to the cloud and incur those transfer rates, those bandwidth rate charges. They can just analyze it in place where it is and put those results out much quicker. And uh, Judd touched on that on the slide before about the workflow benefit, and that's something that we have found time and time again is, yeah, sometimes you can undersize or oversize your Hadoop cluster. Your jobs might take longer. They might take less time, whatever it is. You can optimize Hadoop you know, within an inch of its life to get yourself to the performance metric that you need. But time to results is the key, and everybody seems to neglect that time to actually get the data into Hadoop because it doesn't go there on its own. You have to have, you know, scoop or flume or some sort of object loader or something that gets the data into HDFS, and then you can perform your analysis against it. And analytics in place is really what we're, what we're striving to help our customer base with so that they don't have to waste the time loading data before they can actually derive results from it. And the ability to spin up multiple sandboxes means you can be running lots of different analytics models against the same source data at the same time. So there's a lot of benefit to speeding up the overall workflow, not just the optimization of the, of the infrastructure itself, although they work hand in hand to enable the same thing. So I think this is the, the web analytics company story. You're going to be seeing a lot more from EMC. The customer has agreed that once they complete the project here in the next couple of weeks, we can use their name publicly and things like that. So you'll see this come out as, as pretty big announcements from, from us and with all of the solutions that EMC brought to bear, including the Pivotal Data Suite. This, this is a really uh, exciting project that we've worked on that really shows the value of this overall shift in mindset from it has to be on commodity, it has to be direct attached storage, it has to be done in a, in a very fixed way. This flexibility level really is about moving out of the science fair stage and into the enterprise ready Hadoop stage. So we're really excited about it and look for more coming out about that in the near future. But Judd, I'll turn it back over to you so you can carry on. Thanks, Chris. So some of the other benefits uh, that we didn't talk about yet were um, that were actually leveraged in that uh, second use case that Chris talked about are the ability to run multiple Hadoop instances uh, against an Isilon environment. So you can actually export out multiple Hadoop, Hadoop routes and have different uh, flavors of Hadoop running against Isilon at the same time. Uh, we show you a couple of different settings files that you can modify and tweak here to get that set up. And there's some best practices out there available from, from the ISON folks via EMC 
on how to tune this for each of the different distributions that are available out there. So depending on the distribution of your choice, how to get this tuned up and working uh, just right so that it works great depending on whichever flavor of it you're deploying. Um, from a multi-tenancy standpoint, as you're building out Hadoop as a service, you may have multiple customers that want to consume Hadoop at the same time. And Isalom is actually built with multi-tenancy capabilities in mind. So this is something that you will see coming here in the future release of Isilon, where you can leverage a combination of access zones and that future release to provide dedicated new clusters per tenant. Um, pretty interesting uh, as you're starting to build things out. You may have consumers that want higher performance, consumers that want greater density, um, depending on how you offer that Hadoop as a service to your customers or how you consume it. This could be beneficial, a beneficial capability that you could leverage in a lot of different ways. From a size and guidance perspective, uh, we do see out there some decent numbers on 50 megabytes per second per CPU core for a single map task as far as what you can push through reading input data. Um, that's, that's a good starting point to, to base your designs on. Uh, of course, every job is different. And uh, between Trace3 and EMC, we can offer a, a pretty extensive list of discovery questions to help you properly size and right size your Hadoop environment. Uh, and that can come everywhere from the, the CPU to the memory density to the footprint to the storage and everything in between. But if you just wanted a blind guide to just give you a rough idea of how this would, could work in your environment from an ISOM perspective, you can think one X400 model node per three Hadoop compute nodes as a just starting point reference. Uh, to, that's a good ratio you can use if you just want to get a, a baseline idea before you go through an exhaustive sizing. Uh, one of the other things that we highly recommend that you do as you uh, go about your Hadoop journey is you run Terasort, Terragen, Teravalidate jobs, and you continue to rerun those jobs uh, after every change. We found that as you're building out your Hadoop environment, you can get some really great benefits by running those and using those as a baseline to measure against how you've optimized and modified your environment as you go forward. And within Isilon, there's also very specific tool sets that you can uh, view uh, HDFS specific performance and Hadoop specific performance, and that's via the CLI or using the GUI with Inside IQ. But we recommend that you do that on a regular basis. That we found problems with uh, hardware infrastructure and things like that, and they pop up, and they're very easy to isolate right away when you see drastic differences in your test bench runs between different tweaks and tuning jobs. And of course, as you make those tweaks and tunes, documentation is pretty important. You should document as you go about. Uh, deploying and modifying your cluster over time, change management is, is critical to a well-running Hadoop environment. Uh, this is a quick summary slide to kind of show you a little bit of what we've talked about today. Before we jump into a demo, uh, we can do a quick recap here of some, maybe some of the things that we have missed as we talked about the differences between traditional design and what you get when you leverage Isilon. So the left column here shows you traditional BAS model, and the right is Isilon-based Hadoop. So as you can see, there's some incredibly important capabilities that are missing from the traditional option. Um, the, the protection overhead is, is a pretty glaring number. You can see the delta there. And uh, you know, it's, 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 of course, key to note that the protection overhead of ISLON versus I, HTFS versus ISLON emulation, um, the fact you can share among the different distributions, users and applications, support for the enterprise feature set, such as this after recovery, and of course, being able to decouple storage from compute for independent scaling, all benefits that you will receive if you look to leverage architecture in this different way. So at this point, uh, I'd like to turn the time over to Chris. He can walk us through a demo that shows how easy it is to deploy Hadoop on Isilon in a virtual environment using VMware's big data extensions. Chris? Thanks again, Judd. I just wanted to let folks know, I know there's some, some questions coming up in the Q&A. We're going we're gonna to take all of those at the end. We have a, a whole dedicated section for Q&A, so we'll definitely be answering your questions. If you haven't gotten a reply back, don't, don't panic. We will be answering them. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and, oh, you already hit play. Yay. So uh, what we're seeing here is the, the Isilon login. Um, this is uh, going through and activating the HDFS. Uh, license. It's a free license. It's not something that you have to pay for. Um, you, you, we're just using it as a mechanism to track who's deploying uh, HDFS out in the field. So if you already are an Isilon customer or you, you get an Isilon 
for purchase, just know that the HDFS component comes free. Here in the dashboard, um, the, you can see the cluster config. Uh, as the demo progresses through, you'll see you can go up and add the licensing information in. Uh, it's very easy. We, when you get a license, we just email you a key, copy and paste it in. It's not uh, not going to be anything complex that you haven't probably seen with other software hardware type solutions before. So um, we'll let this get through. The activating the license part, you'll see it's very straightforward. Once the license is activated, the services are installed and, and deployed, and that's really all there is to it. Hey, Chad, is that playing for you? Yeah, yeah I think you must be seeing a delay. Yeah, yeah I think so. If, really if Chris is seeing a delay, I'll, I can jump in. At this point, you're seeing uh, this is the big data extensions capability. This is a plugin yeah. from VMware that allows you to deploy Hadoop in a virtual environment. Um, once you load the plugin and download the bits for the distribution that you want to deploy, and again, you could have multiple distributions, you jump in here into the create new uh, cluster wizard. You name your cluster, uh, and as we talked about earlier, you point your compute environment to the uh, DNS interface of the Isilon cluster, which you saw previously. And, and at this point, you're in, in, in talking to HDFS on Isilon, and you're able to, de to start defining how you want your compute nodes to look from a sizing perspective, uh, how much memory, how much, how much local disk, um, where, where the disk storage should, should be located, the number of vCPUs that you want to be able to leverage for uh, those different compute nodes, how many compute nodes you want, and then I'll also remember that this is elastic, so you can scale up and down this cluster right. uh, over time as, as you continue to use it or you determine the optimal number of nodes for your memory footprint or your, your compute footprint. Yeah. And hey, I'm caught it's up. pretty much in, okay, cool. Go ahead, good, good, Chris. No, no, I was just going to say, at this point, the, the all the customization options, if you've ever been involved in VMware, are very, should be very familiar to you. Um, you can set your cluster password. But the screen before this, you can change your networking settings if you want to do some isolation of traffic, uh, which might be desirable if you're doing something with like a test or sandbox type environment. But you can see in the video, I'll fast forward here, it's it's a very straightforward deployment. What's important about this is this is the only way to truly enable a Hadoop as a service environment internally, right? So if you want to build this for your own internal customers, this is the only way you're going to be able to do that is by deploying on a virtual type platform. It, it takes too long and is too labor intensive to physically rack and stack servers to, to really come close to meeting the demands of a VM as a service environment. What we're seeing a lot of too is a hybrid type environment where there's some physical nodes and some virtual nodes or self-service type virtual environments that allow you to do sandbox testing, Q&A, things like that. Then this, now that the Hadoop cluster has been created, that's the end of this little video snippet. But from here, you can now you can go into your client systems, begin running jobs. Uh, the cluster is up and running and ready to go at that point. So you've got a fully deployed uh, multi-node Hadoop cluster in approximately four or five minutes. From the customer that we referenced before that, that will be doing a lot more uh, publicity and collateral around, uh, we were able to deploy 128, 256 node clusters in 10, 15 minutes. So it's a very simple, very fast process, but it allows you a lot of high depth of customization if you need to do something special to support specific testing parameters or, or config environments or things like that. So, again, the point of this just to show you how easy it is, how quick it is to get a Hadoop cluster up and running in a virtual space, which is something that you just can't get in a traditional Hadoop model. So, Judd, if you want to jump from there. Sure. Thanks, Chris. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, hopefully everyone can see that video. I know we had a little bit of delay there, so sorry about that. <clears throat> If you want to get started with some of this, uh, we've got some links here for you. You can go out and build your same TCO report, uh, just like we showed earlier, to kind of look at the different economics. 
and uh, look at different architectures and how those can impact cost models. And that's something where uh, it's, you just hit this link. I do recommend using the advanced capabilities of the TCO calculator so you can input more granular data points, better data in, better data out. From uh, getting started with Hadoop perspective, there is the Hadoop Starter Kit. Uh, this link takes you to uh, video tutorials along with white papers and walkthroughs and screen grabs on how to set everything up soup to nuts for the various uh, Hadoop distributions that are out there. So depending on which Hadoop distribution you want to stand up, the Hadoop Starter Kit can get you up and running really quickly. And then um, as far as a lot of the knobs that are available out there, we talked about some of the basic ones that you should be aware of as far as getting up and running and turning knobs with ISO on uh, for HDFS. There's a lot of things you can do. You can, you can set the, the block size and you can set the number of threads. And there, there's a myriad of additional options that you can tune. And this uh, blog post out on TypePad uh, gives you a great overview of what a lot of those options are so you can get a little bit deeper than just the basic settings as you tune, tune out your uh, iPhone environment to support your users. So we wanted to uh, we welcome you to consider embracing imbalance and adopting a flexible infrastructure for your Hadoop environment. You get to enjoy the benefits of flexibility, efficient, and efficiency, and you can pivot at will to support your rapidly changing business needs. Uh, and I wanted to, at this point, thank everybody for attending, and uh, we'll turn the time back over to Tim. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Judd and Chris. Great presentation. Um, sorry for the few little glitches we've had. Usually our, our platform is stable. But anyway, we're at the uh, Q&A portion of today's event. Um, again, please continue to ask questions as we go through the next uh, portion of our webinar today. And we'll make sure we try to, to weave those in. Uh, the first question I'm going to ask today is, and we have several, um, there's a question of, is this independent of CDH or HDP? And can you run CDH parallels in this cluster? It is independent. So it does support various Hadoop distributions. So you can run a uh, Hortonworks distribution or a Cloudera distribution and point it against an ISON storage backend. OK. Yeah, and uh, very it should, good. we should so, be clear uh, that Sorry, sorry, can go I ahead. just say we should the, the reference customer that we spoke of, they they uh, are using Pivotal for the project that we're using, but they also did test deployment with Cloudera and uh, had the same experience. So there's there's no difference depending on which Hadoop distribution you're gonna use. Okay, excellent. And and by the way, to our audience, the screen that's up there now you'll see is uh, both Judd and Chris's information. Uh, I would encourage you to take it down if you have questions following today's event. You can always reach out to them directly. Uh, so the next question, we actually had a few about uh, the iOS path and bandwidth and its relationship uh, to the Isilon architecture. Can you guys speak to that a little bit in terms of the ability to scale up and sort of how to achieve best performance with that in, in mind? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, well, so um, so this is something that, that comes up very, very commonly when we have this discussion. Um, there are a couple other questions about this, uh, essentially saying that this, is, this isn't traditional Hadoop. And yes, it's not traditional Hadoop. That's exactly the point. Um, we're trying to break the traditional Hadoop uh, lockstep of having to buy the exact same server over and over and over again. Because while that might work for you know, an initial project or an entry into Hadoop, as you move into wanting to make this actually a core business driver, a core foundational product within your enterprise, uh, it's not supportable. We have customers who don't even own physical servers except to run virtualization on them anymore. So the whole idea of the Hadoop model as it, as it is commonly positioned today is a total anachronism to them and something that they can't get behind. In terms of performance, yes, there is I.O. required. However, what we're finding is when Hadoop was originally developed, the prevalence of high-speed SANs, high-speed shared storage arrays, and more importantly, high-speed networking just wasn't there. So the DAS design was, was put in place to mitigate that limitation. So if I have the data locally, I don't have to wait for the network in order to move it around to get it where it needs to go because it's already sitting there. 
what we've found more and more as we put this into production with customers is that the network is no longer the bottleneck. It actually becomes, as, as Judd and I like to call it, it actually becomes the spinning rust. This is a, a situation where we're finding that not only is performance equal, in a lot of cases with certain jobs, the performance is better because we're reducing the right pipeline. We don't have the 3x copy overhead. And because all of the Isilon nodes are seen as effectively local storage to all of the Hadoop nodes, all of the data is already intrinsically local to each of the nodes. So what we're able to do in a like Hadoop as a service type model where we're deploying virtual Hadoop nodes, we're, we've run side-by-side -side comparisons and they come out about the same. So if I have a physical node and I deploy a virtual node that looks about the same as that physical node with an Isilon backend, one for one, the performance of that comes out the same. The challenge there is that really defeats the purpose of having that platform because the whole point of me having a virtual platform is I can extend my cluster as large as I need to for that job. So the benefit is we can deploy lots of small worker nodes, and by small I mean less memory, less CPU per node, but I can deploy lots more of them. So instead of saying, oh, well, I've got a 10-node physical Hadoop cluster, so I deploy a 10-node virtual Hadoop cluster. No, I have a 10-node physical cluster. I deploy a 128-node virtual cluster, and it gets done half the time or a third of the time. So that's the kind of side-by-side -side performance comparison that we're seeing in the field. And I think the benefit there is the ability to scale up and down based on your workload, right? One of the things that our are a couple of both of the customers that we referenced and a couple of other customers like is that sometimes they have seasonal spikes right around the holidays when people are are busy visiting websites or doing email marketing campaigns they need to spin up additional compute to process jobs faster they can do that really quickly with a virtual environment where they can just throw more additional nodes at it get the jobs done and then turn those nodes off or spin them down as they need so it's not so much a question of is local disk faster than network attached storage or anything like that. The bottleneck is down at the spinning rust level, at the, at the disk heads themselves. The SAS controllers are only going to do about 600 megs a second. A network is faster than that. The isolon nodes are faster than that individually. Your servers are faster than that. So it really is down to pulling data off the disk. And so we've seen lots of side-by-sides. I have some slides as well that I – that I can show if people are interested, but that's its that's its side by side comparison is that there's no difference in performance. Okay, very very good answer and very detailed. I think that's uh, helpful to those that had asked the question about the topic. Uh, while we're still on that topic, and you, I think you did touch this a little bit, but I want to ask this for the attendee um, with the notion of more and more cases of real time streaming data processing. Do you have any thoughts on how? it all rolls into this I.O. bandwidth and, and what we've been discussing this morning. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think I answered one of those out there on the, uh, the Q&A. Um, the real-time stream processing tends to happen in Hadoop node memory. So Isilon can still see the back-end repository to store the output from those jobs. And, and uh, that works, works well with a lot of our customers who are using stream processing technology like Storm and Data Torrent. OK, great, excellent. Um, Another question is, can you provide some uh, best practices and recommendations for Hadoop as a service and self-provisioning por uh, portal? I was typing the response to that right as you were asking it, so I'll hit enter in a second. But uh, so you know, with, the, with the, the virtual version that Chris talked about, it makes it pretty easy because BDE provides all the spin-up, spin-down automation. It does configuration change push for all the yarn side XML, MapReduce, XML settings. All those different XML files that can, you, can, you can modify and can configure heap sizes and Java settings, those get pushed by BDE for you. Um, BDE does snapshotting to, to deploy all the nodes, and then it hooks directly into VCAC for automation, and that gives you your self-provisioning portal. So from a self-provisioning portal use case, that's a pretty straightforward way to go. Um, there are some other ways to orchestrate and automate your Hadoop environment on, uh, on bare metal. Um, there's definitely uh, something where you could work with Trace3 to, to help with that, but a really simple way to do that is with, uh, with VMware and uh, Isilon, with BDE and VCAC. 
Perfect. Very good. Um, another question is, how does the data localization feature work with Iceland? Can you give a little more detail on that? Yeah, I can. Um, so, in fact, I wanted to, there's a couple of slides I wanted to show. I'm going to use the screen share feature so I can figure out how to do it. Where is it? There it is. Um, you can jockey back if you want uh, to or, or, or launch should, your screen share. I hope, yeah, I hope I'm doing this right. Okay. So you guys are going to see the site manager again, most likely. Yep, we see it clear. You're good. Okay. Uh, let me. Okay. So does it just show the part that's in green, Tim? Sorry, I should have practiced with this one. Yeah, it's okay. You're you're fine. Yeah, you're you're perfect. We see just your slide. Okay, perfect. So. So what you're seeing here is the typical MapReduce I.O. breakdown. I'll, I'm going to come back to the rack localization piece in two seconds. But what what the point of this is is that in your typical HDFS read, write, replicate operation, that's that's your, uh, you know, largely tied up in temp reads and writes. That's your shuffle and sort operations. But then you've got a really big chunk at the end, right, of, of HDFS replication. With the Isilon-based solution, that HDFS replication piece goes goes away because the data protection is handled by our file system. So one of the questions that was asked is how do we handle the high availability? That's built into the Isilon storage. It's an enterprise class array. We do uh, read Solomon write protection encoding parity. You can you could do 3x mirroring if you really want to. You could do up to 8x mirroring if you really want to. There's no compelling reason to do that necessarily on an Isilon array, but you can. And what we're doing is we're shifting that now the the hundred percent of the read and write. It's really about the shuffle operation. And what we what we're finding we didn't really mention in any of the previous discussions. What's nice about breaking the storage and compute apart is it makes it really easy to do things like include SSD for your shuffle operations because you're not bound to putting SSDs in each individual server, especially some of our customers, you know, they're they're well over a thousand Hadoop nodes, putting an SSD drive in that would be extremely expensive. Whereas they could put in a small all flash array type solution that would meet their shuffle needs for those high demand jobs. Um, as for the rack locality, generally what we're doing is we're putting compute and isolon nodes in the same rack. And then we use network configuration to force the compute nodes in that rack to go to those Isilon nodes. So this kind of goes to answer a couple of the questions that are floating out there. Um, yes, the, the network can get saturated in theory at some point by read and write operations. If you were to put a thousand compute nodes on a single Ethernet switch, which is cost prohibitive as well as physically prohibitive in most cases, and then your Isilon nodes, it's possible that you could overwhelm a single Isilon node with that type of architecture. We're not we're not a single thread connection though. We have the ability with multiple 10 gig NICs per Isilon node and then all of the Isilon nodes act as a shared connection point to the network. So really any one of these compute nodes could talk to any one of the Isilon nodes. What we're saying is if you really need the locality, and there's not always a benefit to this architecture necessarily either, but if you really need the locality, we can provide that because we provide you the ability to, to target a group of compute nodes at a specific uh, Isilon set of nodes, and you can set that through the network settings really, really easily. The other thing is by having multiple entry points into the Isilon cluster, one of the 10 gig NICs doesn't get overwhelmed. So as a very simplistic example, if you have a three node Isilon cluster, that would give you 60 aggregate gigs of bandwidth in and out of that cluster. And then now you're trying to push 60 gigs of bandwidth from your compute nodes. If you're in a Hadoop as a service type model, remember that you're sharing your 10 gig NICs on your virtual systems amongst your compute nodes there. So it becomes really much more challenging to saturate a network in that, in that sense. And in that simplistic example, that's not something that we would recommend you put into production. It just gives you the idea of the, the throughput that you get is an aggregate level. Um, so what we're seeing is when you put this into an Isilon node, the Isilons will push 740 megs a second per node. 
your 10 gig network bi-directional two ports a node that's five gigs a second um, your switches obviously don't even come close what, what it really boils down to is each drive each physical drive is 30 to 50 megs a second read or write with a typical of workload that's your bottleneck it's it's not the network has far surpassed the bottleneck there you could say that eventually yes maybe this CPU bus memory combo in my server obviously is much faster than the the Isilon node but again even in a direct attached storage model I'm still only pushing 600 megs a second out of my actual physical drives that's all that's all that they are capable of driving so that's really what we see from a rack locality standpoint is trying to group together Isilon nodes and compute nodes if you need to and again it really depends on your network infrastructure the type of jobs that you're running if you have a really widespread Hadoop cluster of physical nodes then having some rack locality probably makes a lot of sense one of the things that we didn't touch in detail but we do have a, a, a Isilon node type that will is just a connection point is just an entry point to the cluster it doesn't add storage it's just a basically a gateway into the cluster you could put a single one of those nodes in each rack to spread the connection load across and give yourself more front side network bandwidth so all of those things tied together are really why we don't see a ton of difference between a physical compute node and an isolon backed environment we've done this in a lot of, of different environments with both with customers and in lab environments and in side by side there is a tipping point if you have a really really tiny Hadoop cluster I've, and by tiny I mean two three four node type cluster you're probably not going to get a benefit from an isolon environment unless you need to store a petabyte of data on your little tiny Hadoop cluster <laughs> um, but the performance is actually probably going to be better on a smaller compute cluster because there's less shuffling involved overall right and so in a three node Hadoop cluster everything's local anyway there's hardly any shuffle space involved in that but what this is really about is as this grows which it does because you have the need to fix that math problem that Judd talked about at the beginning of the presentation when you need to address that fix this is what really unlocks the ability to just apply compute resources to your Hadoop environment instead of having to buy a ton of additional storage space for data that you don't actually need or a ton of additional compute when really what you need to do is store lots of additional data so by scaling those up independently adding more Isilon nodes you actually get more throughput every time you put an Isilon node in so you keep ahead of that network bottleneck curve very good some great detail thanks for weaving in the, uh, the questions that were coming in with regards to the potential bottleneck issues um, next question is um, how does Iceland deal with storing multiple copies of data on HDFS since you've been discussing that a bit now yeah so I guess I'll take that and give Chris a break so uh, Iceland emulates HDFS so it tells it tricks the Hadoop cluster into thinking it's writing to HDFS under the coverage covers it's just leveraging the uh, the Iceland 1FS file system which uses forward error correction to eliminate a lot of the overhead with traditional RAID systems so this is not a traditional RAID architecture um, and that that's how you really get those 80 percent efficiencies you're writing to a POSIX compliant file system under the covers and uh, you're able to leverage the benefits of what Iceland has, has brought to the market uh, for the last uh, number of years as a leader in scale out NAS uh, part of that is really efficiency now it also emulates some of the roles so you get some of that that rack awareness that you would with uh, with a new cluster you know it tells it tells the Hadoop environment that it's doing that as well right so it comes down to um, basically tricking Hadoop into thinking it's talking to ACFS so you get all the benefits there but uh, you don't have to go in and do a lot of the tuning there Excellent. So uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time and we've had a lot of questions. So I want to thank our audience for some great questions um, and some really great answers to those questions. I want to make sure everyone is uh, rest assured that we are going to send all the questions directly to Judd and Chris and they will be able to get back to you directly. So, so don't worry that uh, we weren't able to get to your question directly during the live event. You will get an answer shortly. I just have a few, a few very quick announcements to make please mark your calendars for September 16th 
and our next Data Science Central webinar, Hadoop 2.0, Yarn for Further Optimize, I'm sorry, Yarn to Further Optimize Data Processing, which is sponsored by Hortonworks. Uh, also, as I mentioned, this event is being taped and will be made available later on this afternoon at datasciencecentral.com. And this brings our event to a close. I'd like to thank our audience again, some great questions and their participation. And a special thank you to Trace3 for their sponsorship and to Judd and Chris, really great presentation, guys. Uh, good use of the live demo stuff. Did a great job. My name is Tim Madison. I'm very pleased to have been your host for today's event. I look forward to seeing you all again on September 16th. Good day. <laughs>